Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. This is BRN AM for Monday, April 15th, 2024. And our top story today, the pension risk transfer market continues to heat up. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Michael Clark is with Ageless Partners. Mike, it's so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Let's talk about the pension risk transfer market, or better known as PRT. First, let's let's take a step back for those watching who may not be familiar with transferring risk. What is a PRT transaction? Now, at in a, in a high level general terms, right, when we think about pension risk transfer, a, a company that maintains a pension plan, they bear all of the risk. And so by doing a risk transfer, they're transferring it to some other entity. And that's done typically in two ways. One way is by offering an individual in that pension plan the opportunity to cash their benefit out. So instead of taking it as an annuity, say when they turn age 65 and getting payments for the rest of their life, actuaries will calculate the present value of that payment stream and a company will be able to offer that to a participant and they can take it as a lump sum cash out and then they can roll that over into a 401k IRA. And, and effectively, the company's transferred risk from themselves to the individual. So that's one way. The more common, when we refer to PRT, the more common way that that is done is a company actually going and saying, hey, I'm going to go out to the insurance market and say, hey, rather than me pay these people a certain monthly benefit amount when they turn 65, how much would you charge me to do that instead? And uh, so they'll go out to the insurance market and they will transfer their pension liabilities to an insurance company for a premium. And at that point, the insurance company becomes responsible for, for managing all of the risks associated with paying those benefits to those people um, based on the terms of the, the provisions of the plan. And, uh, and, and effectively, then the company's transferred risk from themselves to an insurance company. And, and let's talk about volumes because um, this has become, and we read about it in the popular press and in, in the trade press, uh, this has become a put a, a popular type of transaction for many uh, private, what I would call private sector or not-for-profit pension plans. Yeah, absolutely. And this really came about in 2012 is when this wave started. In 2012, we saw two large pension risk transfer transactions, one for GM and one for Verizon. And uh, it used to be prior to those two transactions, which totaled, if I remember correctly, over $30 billion. Um, prior to that, the pension risk transfer market was somewhere at $2 billion or less per year, and it was largely due to plans that were terminating and going through that process and transferring all of their risk to an insurance company. Um, so, But GM and Verizon in 2012 really opened the floodgates to this market that has steadily grown since then. Now, after 2012, um, it dropped back down, but it's, it's steadily grown since then to where we even hit a high watermark in 2022, um, where the pension risk transfer market uh, transacted over $50 billion in pension liabilities that were transferred from companies to those insurers. Um, we haven't seen the final numbers in 2023. It's expected to be in the 40 billion plus range. And uh, 2024 estimates are, are already assuming that we're going to be $45 billion plus. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's obviously a lot of money movement. Um, how do you, let's talk about the process. I think that's from a you know retirement guy, a retirement nerd like myself. How does one facilitate a so if you're the if you're the the employer let's take let's take it from the employer's perspective they decide that they want to transfer risk I'm, I'm assuming that's a decision unto itself to do to do that you have to look at the balance sheet you have to look at the the plan can you fund it can you not fund it that's a, that's where the actuary comes in but how do you go through the process of choosing um to do that and then transfer to a insurance carrier because that's where you that's where you're shifting the risk yeah, that's a that's a great question because when you, uh, the, the, you the way that you should look at this is just like any other transaction involving pension plan money. So you view it from the the perspective of of fiduciary. So you've got a fiduciary committee that has to act in the best interest of plan participants. And so when th there, there are several procedures that are out there that companies will go through to document that they have followed a prudent process in selecting that insurer that they want to transfer those benefit liabilities to. So they'll generally, there's generally three parties involved uh, from a service provider standpoint that uh, a company will work with. 
One is a, a bid or transaction specialist. They're the ones that are responsible for getting bids from the different insurers that are interested. Um, they obviously are trying to help optimize what that is from a plan sponsor perspective. Um, it's more of a settler function rather than a fiduciary function. Um, but at the end of the day, you view all of this as this, we're talking about disposition of assets from a qualified plan to another entity. You, you do have to view it from a fiduciary lens in total. The other party that you'll see involved commonly is what's known as an independent expert. This independent expert is responsible for doing the due diligence on the various insurers that are interested in taking on those pension liabilities, which in the market today, there's about 20 different insurers that participate here. And they all have different things that they like to focus on. You have some that focus on huge transactions over a billion dollars. You have others that say, you know, we don't want anything more than 20 million and you have everything in between. Um, but the, the independent expert will go out and evaluate these insurers on very specific criteria that were outlined by the Department of Labor in their interpretive bulletin 95-1. Uh, it basically says you can't just rely on credit ratings alone to evaluate an insurer and whether or not they're able to provide what's deemed in the standard the safest available annuity. Um, and so if you look at things like how their general account assets are invested, other lines of business that they have exposure to, the size of the transaction relative to the overall general account of the uh, the insurer. You also look at things like, is this being guaranteed by the, or, or backed by the general account or a separate account? A separate account provides just a little bit more security there. And then you also look at the state guarantee protections um, that uh, th because once a once those benefit liabilities leave that qualified corporate pension plan and go to the insurer, they're no longer backed by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Those insurers, though, are backed by state guarantee associations, and they have different limits in terms of what they will uh, back for a participant's benefit. So you do all of that, and and an, then the company needs to decide: well, do these companies, do these insurance companies meet that safest available annuity criteria? And and what's clear in the standard is that they say that uh, you you can actually determine that more than one insurer is capable of providing that safest available annuity. So you go through that process, determine which insurers meet that criteria go through some sort of bid process, which different providers have different uh, processes for how they do that, um, select an insurer, you sign basically a sales agreement with them that says, yep, we are going to lock in this price, we are going to transfer these benefit liabilities to them, and then you start the transition process with the insurer. Yeah, uh, Michael, and, and I want to take a quick break. We come back, we'll talk more about the PRT process. What do beneficiaries need to know? You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Michael, thanks so much for staying with us. Really appreciate you hanging around for segment number two this morning. You bet. All right. Um, you know, obviously there's a, I, I like that you said document, 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 because as a retirement nerd and a former co-fiduciary, 
a 321 fiduciary, um, that was something that every attorney said, and, and that becomes really important if you're ever challenged in, in the law around yep. a particular decision. Let's talk about what beneficiaries or what we call participants or employees or retirees need to know. I'm, I'm assuming there's some type of notification process that must be sent to anybody who's part of a pension plan that's undergoing this type of transaction. Potentially, and, and I, I wanna talk about this in two different ways. Right. You have companies that will go through a PRT transaction because they're looking to de-risk their plan. They're just they're not necessarily getting rid of the plan altogether, but they may want to carve out a certain group and transfer those liabilities to an insurance company. In that case, uh, it's a real possibility that the first time that a participant finds out that their benefits being transferred is when they get a letter from the company saying, hey, we've transferred your benefit liability. Watch for communication from insurer company XYZ. They're going to send you some information. Um, and uh, and that could be the, the extent of it. The other um, avenue where a participant might get actually some advance notice is if a plan is going through termination. A termination mm -hmm. sounds like a scary word because usually we think of termination as that we're losing something all this means from a participant perspective is that the company is no longer going to administer those benefits and retain that liability. They are going to get out of the pension plan altogether. And because of that, they're going to transfer those benefits to an insurer. So termination is a bit of a scary word, but from a participant perspective, there's nothing actually to worry about. You're not actually losing your benefits. In fact, if they do things the right way, they've transferred all of the legal requirements of the qualified plan that you're in, that the company maintains, and they're transferring all of those provisions to the insurer. So the insurer is going to administer it and protect the benefits in the same way. Um, you're going to have all the same optional forms of payment. You're not going to lose anything. Uh, it, it should transfer one-to-one. -one. Um, and in those cases, though, in termination, you get a little bit more advanced notice because there is a process that the company has to go through. There's different notifications that they have to send participants in advance, well in advance of actually transferring the benefits to the insurer. And when, when the trans, uh, transfer is done, I, I'm assuming that to get your benefit, let's talk about that for a second. So if you're the, in, the beneficiary or the retiree, whatever, when, it's your, when you reach retirement age and it's time for you to get that benefit, you dial the insurance, they, they have a service number, it's serviced, the customer service is done um, by the insurer that accepted the transfer. Yeah, that's correct. So let's talk about this again in two different pieces, right? You've got your, if you're currently in pay and you're receiving your monthly pension check from your company and it gets transferred to an insurer, it's generally a very seamless process where you don't even notice a difference because they'll transfer all of your tax withholding information, all of your direct withholding, your, your direct deposit information to the insurer. And it's a difference of one month you get that payment from your company, the next month you get it from an insurer, but everything else maintains as, as it was. It's very, very seamless. Now, if you're not in payment status already, and it's something that down the road, you're like, all right, well, I'm 65 now, I'm ready to retire, I want to take my pension benefit, you'll have been given information from the insurance company that tells you how you can contact them uh, and, and actually start that process, just like you would as if, the, if it was maintained by the company of going through and saying, hey, all right, what are my options? How can I take this benefit? Because you'll maintain all of those different optional forms of payment and they'll be able to, uh, to assist you in getting that going. Now, the other thing that you get, if you're, uh, and this is true whether you're in pay already or going to be in pay in the future, um, you will get um, an annuity certificate from the insurance company. So you're going to have proof that, hey, yes, this insurance company, this is a, a policy that I have with them and, and, the, and they, they owe this to me. Yeah. And again, you know, people probably, you know, there's a level of sophistication here with these types of benefits. But if you're just a, a regular person like I am, you just want to understand, hey, where do I go? And I, I'm assuming that if you worked for a former employer that transferred a benefit, I guess you could call the former employer's HR department and they would be able to tell you, hey, it transferred to XYZ insurance company. Post-termination post or post-transaction, is there anything for the employer to do other than to serve as a conduit, potential conduit for relaying information on where do, where do I go for my benefit? 
Not really. Not Once they've really. done Once that, they've, they've satisfied, satisfied their fiduciary, their fiduciary responsibilities, responsibilities and, and obligations. If they've gone through that prudent process and selecting an insurer, they can provide the safest available annuity. They're generally done. And like you said, uh, Jeffrey, that uh, a lot of times we see this with, uh, and I've had clients that have been in this situation where an employee calls up and says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take my benefit now. And, and they say, well, actually, your benefit was transferred to insurance company XYZ over here. Here's our contact information. Here's how you get a hold of them. Yeah, I mean, it's just really important. But, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, you, one of the things that y you probably need to do, Michael, and we'll close on this, is you're getting statements. Um, you're getting quarterly statements probably from your 401k, your IRA, your bank statements. You're probably going to get some type of notification. It's a good idea to make sure that you have your email address, your, your, res your current address, all those things updated so that you get those statements. doesn't mean you have to look at them. Uh, regularly, but you just should be getting that information so it flows to your current address. I think a lot of people probably um, don't often do that, and then that results in loss participants, and you don't know where your money is. Yeah, absolutely. It's best practice, right? If you know where that money is, you want to make sure that the, that they uh, are know where you're at so that they can contact you, you can contact them, and, and that there's no um, yeah that no risk of of actually misplacing that benefit. Yeah. Well, Michael, uh, thanks so much for helping break down PRT. I think a lot of people just wanted to understand more. and We really appreciate you joining us. We look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Thanks, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more, and all in one place. That's right, one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content? Well, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN AM. We'll have a very special guest and another important topic. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.